two and a half CMTs. My name is Manish Kata. Last year, we launched a show called Who Charted, which was this concept of giving you six charts in six minutes, covering a lot of the research that's brought out of our research department here at Potomac. However, we wanted to switch it up. There's a lot of uh, Twitter posts and different news headlines that are out there that tie back to charts and really tie back to markets. And so we wanted to bring you something that was more current, more fresh, and a lot of topics that are top of mind. So with that, uh, I have Dan Russo and Drew Wells. They couldn't hold a show on their own, folks, so they had to bring Jordan out of retirement. So here we go again. Drew, let's go. All right, so here we have a percentage uh, hat tip, by the way, to uh, Mike Singleton over at Invictus Research, uh, having a Twitter conversation on uh, how people were positioned and whether or not retail is capitulated and on and on. And I think this chart kind of lends creams to a few things, right? Um, retail arguably hasn't capitulated yet. Uh, I don't personally know anybody that's calling their advisors or their broker and, you know, screaming or crying or, you know, turning their accounts into cash and, you know, as you can see by this chart, it's, you know, a lot of clients are pretty much positioned uh, to eventually capitulate, in my opinion, at some point, if the market, uh, you know, continues its descent uh, downward for the next, you know, six months or a year or whatever. Um, so now, now one thing that's really helped, uh, you know, this environment for people is, the, you know, the bond market has really underweighted, you know, a lot of passive investors bond portion and overweighted their stocks for them if they had not rebalanced, right? So I think that may have something to do with it. but. Yeah, arguably, I don't think people are really just, uh, retail certainly is not really expecting, uh, you know, this market to last uh, any longer on the downside. So nobody knows when it's going to end, but it's interesting to see uh, that clients are, uh, you know, at least retail still hasn't, you know, peaked yet here. Well, I think they're spoiled. I mean, the last, the last what, 10 years, it's been nothing but V bottoms, right? You of know, course. I rarely do client events, but from talking to a handful over the past couple of weeks, whether right or wrong, the attitude is like, it's all good. It's going to come back. You know, it'll snap back and, and you know, we'll, we'll make all time new highs. It'll, it'll come back. But, but what if it doesn't, right? Uh, throw, up the, throw up a chart from 1962 to 1982. Um, there, there's no snapping back. So, throw up a chart, throw um, up a chart from 2000 to 2013. The S&P was yeah. flat in a 13-year period. I think if you really want to, you want to really want to know when retail capitulates, go on to so any platform that's social and make a negative comment about AMC. And when you stop being attacked, when you stop being utterly attacked, that's when you know they've capitulated. Now, I made a negative comment about ANC recently, and I was utterly attacked. They came for me with, you know, the pitchforks and and, and the fire sticks. Yeah. So, I I agree with Drew here. All right, what do you got, Dan? What do I got? Speaking of a retail favorite, uh, the Arc Innovation ETF. This one goes along with the theme of never show weakness in this business. And I think that Kathy blinked. She showed weakness by pretty much begging the Fed to bail her out. Uh, I think her open letter to the Fed is an admission that her strategy is nothing more than a high beta growth strategy that thrives in an easy money environment. Um, the drawdown here is close to 80%. Over the past three years, the three-year rate of change for the ARKK ARK Innovation ETF is negative, right? Remember the uh, remember the commercial they did about the indexes? Like if you're a passive investor and you're just investing in these stodgy old companies like Exxon Mobil, you? You? Um, you know, you're, you're kind of falling behind. It reminds me of back in 1999, late 90s, you know, when, when people were knocking Warren Buffett, right? Saying he'd lost his touch because he was underinvested in tech at the top of the tech bubble. Um, this one's a disappointment for me because I'm a Kathy fan, uh, or at least I was, but it's become pretty evident um, that there's not a ton of risk management um, or, you know, rules around position sizing uh, taking place over there. And her investors are starting to feel that pain. Or look, I mean, look, it, yeah, look, it's, it's she, I stood up for Kathy Wood because I felt like people were piling on her just because she was a woman. Um, and that was my take now. As well. she, yeah, and now she's just whining like every other manager who gets their ass kicked. And so uh, I've sort of had enough of, of Kathy Wood, you know, from a money management standpoint, you know, you try to avoid this single point of failure, right? Uh, part of the success of, of having a track record is simply surviving. And so, you know, you have high concentrations in growth stocks that in many cases you're owning large positions of. And, and now you're just whining. I mean, <laughs> once a money manager starts writing open letters to the Federal Reserve, I think it's it's lights out. So 
Um, I agree you know, with good that. Luck and thanks don't for show playing. weakness. You show weakness, they come for you. All right, what else? What do you got, Drew? What's up? No, mer no mercy. Um, we talked about uh, this a shameless plug for our uh, yeah, Friday note on our intermarket themes. I actually pulled this one uh, from from that, looking at the 60-40 portfolio, right? I think uh, never before in human history have we lived in a time where the average investor has more access to a greater variety of investment vehicle, not just investment vehicles, but strategies within asset classes, within commodities, within equities, within, ex within fixed income, um, you know, in, in currencies even with the ETF suites that are out there and everything. And this is 60-40 portfolio. To, I would argue it's three largest competitors in a downtrend relative to commodities and a big downtrend relative to alternatives there. And you can use any, you know, a variety of proxies. Not a recommendation, obviously, but the only thing that 6040 is doing relatively well against is crypto, which is kind of laughable. You could use Bitcoin as the denominator if you want to, but this is the top three market cap uh, cryptos right there. So look, I, I think that if, I don't know when the time is gonna come, but eventually clients are gonna start asking if we keep going through this period of heightened volatility, the market keeps drawing down, and there are other asset classes that are not detonating. I don't know when the point comes for you know a lot of you know investors that have been kind of plugged into a static 60/40 portfolio to get. Why why don't I have exposure to the other stuff that's maybe going down uh, not as much or performing you know modestly well in this environment? So again, haven't heard that yet, and I don't know how long that's going to take. I would argue you know a significant amount of time. Uh, but look, uh, it, it involves more work. To be honest with you, I think that that's why a lot of these uh, in in the compliance, um, you know, that you that you naturally bring upon yourself as an advisor to put clients into you know alternative strategies is a lot. Uh, so I get it, I get the hesitancy there, but I think we're past the point of no return and I'm having you know an ex not a, again not a recommendation, but you know. well let's so. let's go to the next slide because this is going to trigger Dan. Yeah. All right, so I, this is Dan. my slide, but. Um, I know it's going to trigger Dan a little bit. So this is a Vanguard 2025 year to date total return. OK, so what you see on the screen in terms of the writing is pulled directly from the prospectus. All right. And the, the bold language says the funds asset allocation will become more conservative over time. Now, listen to what I said earlier, right? Avoiding that single point of failure. I understand this is N equals one and you're going to have um, planners all over the country screaming that this has never happened before, yada, 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 deflecting. Uh, because in my opinion, as a manager of any kind, it, it's your job to reduce risk and have a risk management and process in place and not just blindly buy and hold anything. And I think this is going to teach that lesson in real time uh, by, by promoting this buy and hold mentality regardless of the asset class. Because look, it has happened. It's happening right now. A 60-40, you are 2025 in this case, excuse me, you're retiring in three years and you just lost 21% of your money. Thank you. Thanks for playing. I appreciate it. That's not going to fly. So, you know, Dan, go ahead. I just think it speaks <laughs> to, I'm going to not get triggered here. Uh, I just think it speaks to something that Manish, you and I talk about a lot is, you know, not becoming married to your risk off asset, right? A lot of people have been conditioned to believe that treasuries are a risk off asset. So, you know, to set up a strategy that blindly assumes that this one asset is always going to be your buffer uh, is just ridiculous to me. And you're feeling that pain right now. I mean, there are other assets out there that you can rotate into just by doing a little bit of work, like just a little bit, not even a lot, not like diving in the way that we do. I mean, listen, uh, Dan, what about a couple years ago? What was it, Schwab? Everyone was up in arms because they were forcing you to have cash, you know, when that money can be put to work. Well, this is this is your money being put to work in, in, in asset classes that, that, you know, considered risk off, maybe it shouldn't be. And so, you know, it, it, things moving cycles, right? Cash at the end of the day is probably the only risk off asset class out there, in my opinion, at least. I listen, I agree, unless you know, you can hold something unless you can, you know, you can hold your bonds to maturity and you're happy with the yield that you're getting. Um, but that's not the case yeah, here in a product like if, this. If you're out there buying, ETF. if you're out there buying individual bonds, and, and this is a big caveat too, if you're out there buying individual bonds, and you know that you're going to hold them to maturity, and you are not actively distributing money out of that account, you have no you have cash set aside for potential unforeseen emergencies or whatever, 
that's a totally different scenario. But you know, people correct, this doesn't know. apply. This doesn't apply to that, right? This is yeah. this is what most people, conservative allocators at least, own in their 401k. This is what planners are out here recommending. If you want to be conservative, Mr. Investor, right. use a 60/40, use a 20/25. And so now, what are we going to move the goalposts? Are we now going to say that this isn't conservative? What happened to all the speed sign risk scores? That, that they're going to be rebranded. Portfolios? They're going to be rebranded uh, uh, for a decade out. <laughs> after. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, 50 years later, the performance will be better. I don't know. It, it just, you know, I get it. I get the N equals one concept, and I know people are relying on on past data, but at the same time. You know, it, it, from our perspective, at least my personal perspective, it, it's, it's our job as, as managers to, to kind of uh, have processes in place for risk management. So I think th this can be a whole opposite. This can be an episode in itself, Dan. So I'm moving on. What's your next slide? All right, fine. <laughs> All right. I think that uh, Tesla is now a special situation. Uh, I think it's a special situation stock. It also happens to be uh, ARK's biggest holding, but... You know, I think the question out there is you essentially have a CEO who, while he is a genius, some people call him the Da Vinci of our time. Um, we can debate that all you want. But uh, yes, he's a genius. Uh, yes, he's also an egomaniac who thinks he could do whatever he wants. And if you're a Tesla shareholder um, and this guy's out there, you know, he's going to now go buy Twitter. Who's going to run Twitter? Right. How many businesses can this guy run efficiently? And if you're the if you're a Tesla shareholder, how do you feel comfortable with what's going on right now? So I think that this is a special situation stock, right? If you want to kind of break it down technically, uh, 200 is obviously a key level here. To me, if you breaks 200, you know, look out below. Um, I get it. There are longer term investors out there that think that Tesla's changing the world and that Elon is a genius, and he is a genius. Um, but he can't run all these companies, and if he has to come to the market with a slug of stock. Right. What does that mean? Basic supply and demand. The man who runs the company might have to come to the market with a slug of stock to finance buying this other company that's out there that he basically just made like a vanity slash ego bid for is absurd to me. And if you're an investor in Tesla, you should be irate. And if the stock breaks 200, now you're going to be in a very bearish trend and you should be more irate. I'll stop there. You know, if, if you talk about sports and you're hanging out at, at a barbershop or a bar and, you know, some idiot kid does something dumb at 19 because you gave him $50 million, you know, some of it's excused, right? And I kind of feel like in this situation, like he is a genius. He can do whatever he wants. It's up to us to decide what we want to do with that. So I'm, I'm pro Elon and pro Tesla. So there's nothing you can say about that. Drew, what do you got? Not a lot of, a lot of Teslas in West Virginia or what? You're the only person I know with a Tesla, I think, but uh, I have seen one floating around here. Um, Drew, what do you got next? All right, so um, we have a chart here that kind of drives me a little bit crazy. I don't think that we've had like enough uh, real intense opinions on this show so far. So uh, this, this is one of the things that I saw being calculated before the close of the market. Okay, so this was last Thursday. If you remember, the market uh, opened down 2%, closed up 2%. I saw three or four Twitter accounts, some reliable, some not, calculating this uh, event happening before the close. And I think that we're turning every little market event into some kind of like talking point or fodder and everybody's kind of getting lasered in on trying to, you know, find the bottom or whatever, you know, bottom's gonna, there's a sample size of like nine in this, by the way, which is, you know, nobody really uses that, you know, and money management that I know of at least because it's really small with a high probability of error. So um, I think everybody's kind of trying to pick a bottom for a good reason. If we go back to that first chart that I showed, right? Households are, you know, as a percent of financial assets or overweight to equities, right? You, if you're overweight to equities, you kind of need a bottom and you love this type of stuff, this random, you know, market price action where people come up with these, you know, if the market's done this and, you know, the moon phase happens to be at this time of the year or whatever. And, you know, we turn this into some great big grand you know, Story string it into clarity. some big grand narrative that everybody like loses their mind over like zoom out, take a look at the primary trend. All this stuff is occurring below the 200 day moving average, by the way. We generally know, which is sloping down. We generally know that big market events happen more frequently below the 200 day moving average. We're in a period of heightened volatility. We've all seen the charts of the biggest set days occur, you know, in periods of heightened volatility. Like take a step back, look at the long term trend. If you're a trader, you know, and you are, you know, in the market on a shorter term time frame, you are loving this stuff. But if you are an investor, man, you you need to go play golf or something like that. I mean, go get away from this stuff. 
Well, That's you see this, you see this online a lot where, where they're, you know, uh, this market is crazy, you know, I've never seen this before. And, and, and frankly, it's usually, you know, uh, folks who are 35 and under, you know, and, and not to not to be the old man screaming at clouds here. But, um, you know, it, the simple fact is that, you know, if you live through 08, if you manage money through 08, literally, if you manage money through any downtrend, uh, this volatility is all perfectly normal. Um, it says it right there in the VIX. Uh, downtrends, you know, downtrending things happen in downtrends, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is the kind of image that will, will also trigger Dan. So I'll let him go and then we can wrap it up. No, it's not going to trigger me. I'm tired of being labeled as the person who gets triggered. This <laughs> show number one. I can see the theme we're going with here. I honestly think that a lot of these calls, these people who try to call the bottoms, I've started to think that they are more business calls than they are market calls. They have right? to. You, you know, if you, you know, you need the market to go up, right? If, if yeah. your business model relies on people staying engaged, right? If you're, you know, kind of a click-based model or if your business model is an AUM type model um, and the 60-40 portfolio, as we know, is down 20%, stocks are down 25%, um, you need you need those assets to rally, right? So you need to get out there and call the bottom and say, don't worry, everything's gonna be okay. Um, that's a business call. People were calling the bottom in bonds in April. And I remember being like, what are you looking at? And right. you know, here we are, here we are in October and the ag on a total return basis just went through its 2018 lows. So, you know, your call was terrible in, in April. I get why you made it, um, but you got run over. And, for the love of God, please wait till the market closes to calculate some kind of market event if you're going to do it, though. Uh, it drives me crazy. If any of you are watching this, please do that. You know, I know who you are. No, it's good. So, but I do. All right, let's wrap it up. Thank you all for joining us on Two and a Half CMTs. And until next time, howdy. <laughs> I have nothing to add there.